Good morning. It's good to be with you this morning. I'm looking forward to diving into God's Word with you. You know, it's been said that the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. And that's true in a lot of different ways. Like uh, if, if you're looking for my family on the weekend uh, in the springtime, you're probably going to find us at a baseball field or a softball field. And, and the way you would know that is because you look at past behavior. My kids are playing baseball or softball every single spring. You can find me there, right? Uh, if you stay out late on a Saturday night, you're going to be tired on Sunday morning for church. How do I know? I've done it before. The sun tonight is going to set in the evening, and it's going to rise in the morning. How do I know that? Because I've seen it happen before. Traffic lights turn from green to yellow. That's where you're supposed to slow down, not speed up. Green to yellow to red, and then eventually, at some point, back to green again. How do I know that? Because I've seen it before. When the calendar finally hits summer, it's going to be hot outside. How do I know? I felt it before. It's all, it's all patterns. Our, our minds perceive the world and build expectations based on patterns that we have observed in the past. So when something happens outside of those patterns, we're we're surprised or we're jarred or maybe even disturbed because we're used to these kind of patterns. We're designed to perceive past behavior and use that information to maybe predict the future. And, and we've talked about before how the faithfulness of God works that way. We've seen God be faithful in the past. We've, we've seen it in the Scriptures. We've seen it in other people's lives. We've even seen it in our own lives that God is faithful. And, and so then because of that past behavior, I know that in my present and in my future, that God will continue to be faithful. Well, it also works that way with resurrection. So we've been studying the Apostles' Creed together as a church, and this week we're looking at the line that says, we believe that Jesus descended to the dead and rose again on the third day. And I want to show you this morning that the Old Testament sets the pattern for third day resurrection. And Christ fulfills that expectation, and I'm going to show you what I mean. Last week we talked about how uh, Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, and we began in 1 Corinthians 15. I actually want to do that again. I want to begin in 1 Corinthians 15, and I want to show you what I'm looking at. Let's go ahead and begin in verse 3. Paul writes, For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. And and if you were here last week, that's that's kind of what we covered. He died for our sins in accordance with the Scripture. And and Christ fulfills the Old Testament Testament. Day of Atonement. But then verse 4, look what it says. That He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. So this morning I want to show you how the Old Testament anticipates the resurrection of Jesus on the third day. Before we do that, I, I want to address something that might be jumping off the page at you. Um, we've, as we've been looking at the creed, and, and you've seen the, the bumper video before the sermon, you've seen it says he descended to the dead. But if you grew up on the creed, or, or maybe you know the more classic version, you probably, you're not familiar with that line, you're familiar with he descended into hell. And you're like, well, what's going on there? Very quickly, I want to explain to you it's, it's kind of a misunderstood translation is what's going on there. The, the Apostles' Creed was not written in English, and so the word that's used there, first of all, uh, he descended into hell is not a line that was even in the oldest versions that we have. Um, it's kind of an added in later, later version, uh, into, la- into later versions. Uh, but that word translated actually better fits with uh, the Greek word Hades 
or the Hebrew word Sheol, which simply means the place of the dead. Not that Jesus entered into the place of torment, hell, but he entered into the realm of the dead. What it means is simply this. Jesus really died. That's all that it means. And that's important for a few reasons. One of the reasons we looked at last week, the fact that Jesus really died means that you and I can really receive the forgiveness of sins. That's important. But the fact that Jesus really died also is important for us this morning because if Jesus really rose from the, if Jesus really died, then Jesus really rose from the dead. And that's important for us. And so we're going to look at that together. Now, if you think about the resurrection of Jesus, and, and we're going to be to Easter here pretty soon, and we'll, we'll probably hit it again and there, but as you, as you think about the resurrection of Jesus, his disciples didn't see it coming. They were surprised by it. But in Luke chapter 24, and why don't you go ahead and turn there with me, Luke chapter 24, you have this story of Jesus meeting with his disciples and speaking to them in such a way as if Jesus thought his disciples shouldn't have been surprised at all. Jesus thought his disciples should have seen it coming. And I want to show you Luke 24. Um, these, these disciples are walking on the road to a place called Emmaus. And Jesus shows up on the road. They don't recognize him. And he says something like, uh, what, what are you guys talking about? And they say, well, the things that have taken place in Jerusalem over the last few days. And Jesus, I just imagine with a smirk on his face, is like, oh, what things? And what's taking place in Jerusalem? And they say, are you the only person in Jerusalem who doesn't know what's happened? We thought we had the Messiah on our hands. And they killed him. Jesus responds, look, uh, verse, verse 25. Oh, foolish one and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? So notice what Jesus has said there. He says that the prophets have spoken in such a way that the, the disciples should have known, they should have known that it was necessary that the Christ should suffer death and be raised from the dead. And verse 27, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. I want to point out to you that when it says all the scriptures, that's not talking about the New Testament. At the point when Jesus is having this conversation with them, there is no New Testament. He's talking about the Old Testament, the things concerning himself. Well, Jesus appears to his disciples another time in Luke 24. And in verse 44, Jesus says to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms might be fulfilled. Now, let me explain something to you very quickly. This might be uh, surprising to you, but Jesus was Jewish. And so Jesus' understanding of the way that the Old Testament is organized is a very Jewish way of understanding it. So the Jews organized the Old Testament by law, prophets, and what they call writings. The law is the first five books, the books of Moses. And then you have prophets. And you and I know prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the minor prophets like Jonah and Micah. Those are prophets, and they, those are prophets for them too. But they also include in the prophets like Joshua and Judges, and Samuel, those are also prophets for them. So you've got the law, the prophets, and then they have the writings, like the catch-all writings. Uh, Jesus calls it the Psalms because the Psalms is included in the writings, and it's really long. You could just call it the Psalms, but it's also got Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, and it's got uh, Esther, and, and it's got uh, Ruth, and it's got Chronicles is, is, is a part of the writings. And so look what Jesus says in verse 44. Everything written about me in the law, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. Once again, the Old Testament. And said to them, thus it is written. What he means is, in the law, the prophets, and the writings, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day 
rise from the dead. So Jesus seems to think that his disciples should have picked up on it by knowing the Old Testament. They should have known that the Christ would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to show you resurrection hope on the third day in the law, the prophets, and the writings. It's going to be a lot. That's why Alan told you to buckle up. So I'm going to hit you with a bunch of scripture, and feel free to turn there. It's going to, a lot of it's going to be on the screen. I'm going to summarize some of it for you. You might be better to just write it down, and please check me later. Uh, but I want, you, I want you to see what I see. First, resurrection hope in the law. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32, verse 39, the Lord God is speaking. It's the song of Moses, but God is speaking, and, and, and he says, See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God besides me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. There is none who can deliver out of my hand. So the Lord God himself says, I reserve the right to kill and to make alive. You notice the order there. To kill and then make alive. And I think that that statement summarizes what we find in Genesis chapter 22. And I'd like you to turn there if you can. Genesis chapter 22. We're going to be there for just, just a minute. You've got the story of Abraham and Isaac, his son. Now, God promised Abraham that his offspring would multiply. And through Abraham's offspring, all families of the earth would be blessed. And when God made that promise, Abraham had no child. But Abraham believed God, and even though he had to wait, and even though he had to wait, and even though he had to wait, his son Isaac is finally born. And God makes it clear, it's through this son Isaac that the blessing will come. The promise is for this son Isaac that you've had, and, and Abraham believed God. So then Genesis 22 shows up, and things get a little off-putting. So in verse 2, it says, God says, take your son your only son, Isaac. Not to be mistaken, you know. It's the one son, the one I told you about. Whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. God says, take the son of the promise, and I want you to kill him. Well, Abraham believes God. Look in verse 3. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God told him. He's taking Isaac to the mountain to kill him. Verse four, on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship. Abraham saying, I'm going over there to kill my son. And we will come back to you again. Well, that, that doesn't make any sense at all. I'm going over there to kill him, but then we're going to come back to you again. And so Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father, and and he said, here am I, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. Isaac is a dead man. Verse 9. When they came to the place of which God had told them, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound his son Isaac, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Isaac is a dead man. Verse 10, then Abraham reached 
out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. Isaac is a dead man, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He said, here am I. The angel said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. See, Genesis 22 shows us resurrection hope. And I'm not making it up because the author of Hebrews points out to us in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 through 19, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Genesis 22 is showing us resurrection hope in the law. There are also examples of resurrection hope in the prophets. So the book of Samuel is, is one of the Hebrew prophets. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, Hannah has this beautiful song at the beginning. It kind of sets up the rest of the book, and, and she echoes Deuteronomy. She says, the Lord kills, and the Lord brings to life. He brings down to Sheol, remember that's the realm of the dead, and raises up. Resurrection hope is in the prophets. It's, it's in the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 25, beginning in verse 7, says, And the Lord will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all the peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. What is the veil that is spread over all nations? What is the covering that is cast over all the peoples? Well, it, we're, we're going to see. What is the thing that the, that the Lord is going to swallow up? Verse 8, the Lord will swallow up death forever. Death is the veil, is the shadow that is over all people. And he will swallow up death forever and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth for the Lord has spoken. The, Isaiah prophet, the prophet Isaiah speaks of resurrection hope. Isaiah chapter 50 I, I would like you to turn there if you can. Isaiah chapter 53 is written about the Messiah. And it says things like, He was despised and rejected by men, a, a man of sorrow, uh, acquainted with grief. He was wounded for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, but he opened not his mouth. But in verse 8 and 9, it explains to us more specifically that he really died. In verse 8, it says, By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Verses 8 and 9 of Isaiah 53 explain to us that the Messiah really died. But then in verse 10, it gets kind of weird. Because look what it says. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for sin. He shall see his offspring. How does he see his offspring if he's dead? He shall prolong his days. No, you told me he died. How does he get to prolong his days? The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. How if he's dead? Verse 11, out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. How will he see and be satisfied if he's dead? By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many. He shall divide the spoil with the strong. Why if he's dead? Because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. 
How if he's dead? Well, he's not. There's resurrection hope in Isaiah 53. There's resurrection hope in another prophet. How about uh, Ezekiel? Ezekiel chapter 37. Uh, Ezekiel is a prophet during the uh, exile. So the people uh, of God are, are uh, defeated and captured and taken into captivity in, into Babylon, into exile. And Ezekiel, the prophet, is there in exile with them. And God gives him a vision. It's a valley of dry bones. It's a bunch of dead bodies. And they've been there a long time. And God said to Ezekiel, what I want you to do is I want you to prophesy over those bones. I want you to speak life into them. And so Isaiah prophesies. And in this vision, the the bones begin to rattle and and muscles and and, and all these things start to cover the bones. And they they stand up and they begin to live. He he prophesies again and the breath of life fills these these, uh, dry bones. And now these are living beings. And the Lord God speaks to Ezekiel. And this is the point of the vision. He says, uh, those dead bodies, that's the house of Israel. And their dry bones is when they're in exile. They're in the grave in exile, but there's coming a day when I'm going to call them out of exile and I'm going to bring them back to the promised land. I'm going to call them out of their graves and they will live again. There's resurrection hope in Ezekiel. What about one of the minor prophets? What about the story of Jonah? You know the story of Jonah? God, it's one of my favorites. I love Jonah so much. God tells Jonah, I want you to go preach a message to the Assyrians in Nineveh. And Jonah doesn't want to. So he goes the opposite direction. Jonah chapter 1 is the story of Jonah descending to the dead. Because when God says, Jonah, go to Nineveh, he says no. And he goes the opposite direction. Jonah 1 says that he, he goes down, he descends to a city called Joppa where he gets on a boat. He's going to take that boat in the opposite direction. He gets on the boat. Where does he go? He goes even lower. He goes into the bottom of the boat. He descends into the boat. The Lord sends a storm and they're all going to die. The sailors realize that it's Jonah's fault. They pick him up. They throw him overboard. He goes down even further into the depths of the sea. He's descending to the dead. And then what happens? A great fish swallows him and really rescues him is what happens. Jonah makes this clear in Jonah chapter 2. This is his prayer to the Lord. He says, I called out to the Lord out of my distress and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol, the realm of the dead, I cry. And you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I'm driven away from your sight yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever, yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. He saved him from death. And then what happens? This great fish vomits him onto dry land. And there's Jonah. God gives him the same message. Remember how I said go preach to Nineveh? Same thing, Bubba. (laughs) Get to it. And So Jonah goes to Nineveh. And this is the message. Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. In other words, you're all dead men. You're all dead men. No, uh, Jonah goes into Nineveh and he begins to preach this message. You're all dead men. And how long does he preach this message? Three days. And after three days, the king of Nineveh hears this message and he repents. He, he turns from his sin and the Lord relents from the disaster that he intended on Nineveh. See, after three days of being told that they are dead men, their lives are given back to them. There is a theme of resurrection hope in Jonah and in the prophets. And there's resurrection hope 
in the writings. What about the Psalms? Psalm 16, King David wrote, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. David wrote that about himself. And as the Apostle Peter points out in the book of Acts, wait a minute, David died. As a matter of fact, there's his tomb right there. There's, there's his, let's go look at his bones. He, he did go down to Sheol. He did die. His body did see corruption. My, my parents just got back from Israel and they sent me a picture of, there's King David's tomb. There, there it is. Let's go look at his bones. But in Psalm 16, he says, you will not abandon my soul to Sheol. There is, there is something going on there. There's resurrection hope. Psalm 49.15, God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol. He will receive me. Psalm 71, verse 20, you who have made me see many troubles and calamities will revive me again. From the depths of the earth, you will bring me up Again, what about a different book in the writings? What about the book of Esther? I love that story, the, the story of Esther. Esther is queen of Persia. Her husband is the king. And there is, this, there is this plot that all the Jews in the land are going to be exterminated. And the problem is that Esther is Jewish. Her uncle comes to her and tells her, Esther, you got to do something about this. You, you've got to go talk to the king and try to figure something out here. And she says, I can't do that because the law says if I go before the king unbidden, I'm a dead woman. And her uncle says, well, you know what? Uh, you're a dead woman either way. Don't, don't think that you're going to escape. And Esther's like, well, you, you know you're right. She says, I'm going to take Take my life in my own hands. She says, if I perish, I perish. I'm a dead woman either way. I'm going to go before the king, and I'm going to try to save the day. But before I do that, what, what does Esther say? What does she want to happen? A fast for three days. And after three days, Esther goes in before the king, and she receives her life back. There is resurrection hope in the writings. It's there in the law, it's, it's there in the prophets, it's there in the writings, but what about the third day? Jesus says that he would be raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Is that there? Yes. Abraham journeyed three days with a son that was as good as dead. And on the third day, the son was given his life back. Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. And then he was given his life back. Jesus makes this point. Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. Just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And then he was resurrected from the dead. The people of Nineveh heard Jonah's preaching for three days before they were delivered from death. Esther and the Jews fasted for three days before they were given their lives back. The prophet Hosea proclaims in chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, Come, let us return to the Lord, for He has torn us that He may heal us. He has struck us down, and He will bind us up. After two days, He will revive us. On the third day, He will raise us up that we may live before him. And even in the book of Ezra, you know, the Babylonians came in and they, they leveled the temple. And the people of Israel were in captivity for 70 years. And finally, they were sent back to rebuild the temple. And Ezra chapter 6 says that the temple was completed. The rebuilt temple was completed on, you'll never guess, which day of the month. The third day of the month. Well, you fast forward to John chapter 2. And Jesus goes into the temple. And He starts turning over tables and running out animals and cleansing the temple. And the Jews are furious. They say, by what authority do you do, you do this? What, what sign do you have? And Jesus says, 
destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. It's as if Jesus is saying, you, you've read Ezra, right? Remember when it was raised on the third day of the month? You haven't seen anything yet. See, the Old Testament establishes the pattern. God makes dead things come to life. And Jesus thinks that his disciples should have known it by, by knowing the Old Testament. They should have thought, well, of course Christ was risen from the dead. Of course it was on the third day. What other day would it have been? Of course. God makes dead things come to life. The best way to predict future behavior is by observing past behavior. We see in the Old Testament that we should expect resurrection on the third day. Christ died for our sins in accordance with with the Scriptures. He was raised from the dead on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. And that's, that's a great thing for us to look at and to know and to study and to, to go look at later and find more examples later. But how does that influence our lives in this moment now? I, I thought of four things very quickly. Number one, since Jesus rose from the dead, then He is who He says He is. He is who He says He is, and that's a big deal because Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. His resurrection from the dead proved that He was telling the truth. That's what Romans 1-4 means when it says, Jesus was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. See, anyone can say anything about themselves, but at some point, they've got to prove it. So, we've got Mark's golf tournament coming up, gentlemen. And imagine a scenario where I spend the next several weeks telling you how incredible I am at golf. And I've got the longest drive. I've got the best short game, and you're all going to be crushed. Well, at some point, you're going to want to see it with your own eyes, aren't you? And you would show up. I'll just tell you what would happen. You would show up to the tournament, and you would not see that. I'm a terrible golfer. But Jesus claims that he is the Son of God, and then He is vindicated when He's risen from the dead. So that's what Jesus mean when, means when He quotes Psalm 118. The, the stone that the builders rejected have become the cornerstone. So when they, when they built ancient buildings, they would pick a cornerstone, a, a perfect place to start, and from that stone, they would build the rest of the building. Jesus says, I'm the stone. You guys are the builders. And when you crucified me, you, you rejected me. But what you didn't know was that I should have been the cornerstone. And I proved it when I was risen from the dead. Jesus is the Son of God. What is the evidence? He's risen from the dead. So number two, since Jesus rose from the dead, then He deserves my obedience. Jesus is vindicated by his resurrection. So that means that everything else that he has to say carries weight. Like if he's telling the truth on the big thing, then, then we would be smart to assume that he's telling the truth on the other things as well. Like if there's ever a debate on what is right and good and true, then I think I should probably align myself with the man who rose from the dead. And Jesus has told us some things, hasn't he? What are some things that he has told us? He said things like, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Not rail against them on social media. We could just go back and read the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. We could go back and read it all. And Jesus has a lot to say on subjects like anger and lust and divorce 
and retaliation and forgiveness. And he says a bunch of things that we don't really like. We don't really want to do those things. And so then Jesus says this. He asks this rhetorical question. Then why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Since Jesus rose from the dead, he deserves our obedience. And number three, since Jesus rose from the dead, then nothing is too difficult for the Lord. The resurrection, think about this with me for a second. Everything that we just walked through, the the resurrection of Jesus unfolds throughout the story of the Bible in such a way that Jesus thought we, we should have seen it coming. And... And these historical events, these things that we read about in the Old Testament, those things really happen. Genesis 22 with Abraham and and Isaac, and on the third day, that really happened. And Jonah really happened. And the, the temple was rebuilt on the third day of the month. That really happened. If God can orchestrate all of that human history to demonstrate the way he intends to move in the future? Don't you think that God can meet you in whatever need you might face today? Let me say it a different way. If even death bows to the will of God, don't think for one second that your problems are too difficult for him. See, God makes dead things come to life and And that's true on a a big level, but that's also true in other things as well. There is no relationship that is too dead for God to bring it back to life. Wounds can be healed. Broken things can be restored. Bodies that are sick can be made well. Addictions can be overcome. Because if God can raise the dead, then that means God can do anything. So what need do you have? What what impossible do you have? Why don't you bring it to the one who's made it a habit to do the impossible? Romans 8 says that he who did not spare his own son, will he not also freely give you all things? And number four, Since Jesus rose from the dead, then death doesn't have the final word. The resurrection of Jesus teaches us that death is not final. And have you been to a funeral before? I bet you have. Death feels pretty final. I haven't seen my grandfather in a few years. The resurrection of Jesus tells me that death isn't the end of the story. Isaiah announced it. Isaiah 26, 19. Your dead shall live. Their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy. Paul proclaims it. 1 Corinthians 15, 26. The last enemy to be defeated is death. And here's what he means by that. He explains in in 1 Corinthians 15 that Jesus' resurrection is a kind of first fruit. Since he was raised from the dead, then all of those who are united to Christ by faith will also be raised from the dead. That should be our expectation. If Jesus is raised, then we shall be raised. The future of those of us who are united with Christ by faith is not some disembodied state of some like ghost playing a harp in the clouds. That's not heaven. That's not what's being explained to us in 1 Corinthians 15. What's explained to us in 1 Corinthians 15 about our future because Jesus was raised from the dead, the trump shall resound. The Lord shall shall descend. And those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus will be raised from the dead to live forever. 
That is the promise of God. We will join in with the Apostle Paul and the prophet Isaiah and we will taunt death together. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, death, where is your victory? Jesus is risen from the dead and we will also be risen. So we don't have anything to be afraid of. And we don't have to mourn like everybody else mourns. Because Jesus defeated death forever. He has risen from the, third, from the dead on the third day according to the scriptures. Why don't we pray together?